I'm Anna Mazera. I'm a journalist uh, at La Stampa, where I'm public editor. And I direct a master's degree in journalism at the University of Torino. And uh, I've known uh, Dave Weiner before we met for a long time, because we've, uh, I mean, I've, I've known who he was since the blogging era. Uh, Dave, Dave Weiner is the, is the person who basically is one of the developers, inventors of the blogs, of the blogging system, of, uh, of, the, um, of the way that um, we do also audio online with podcasts. He invented podcasting. He did RSS syndication. He is a, a person who has, uh, has been to the web, to the open web, and is to the open web. I've, I've read this online, so I, I like to say it. I want to say it. Uh, I mean, some people say that he is to the open web what Richard Stallman is to uh, open source uh, free software. So uh, I think uh, it's, uh, it's really important to talk with you since we are at the state of the net and we've been talking about consequences. I mean, what happened to the open web? Why is the open web platform so important? And uh, when, I, when we started listening to all the events today, he scribbled on the back of my notes, the web is not dead. And he scribbled that when Hossein was talking, because Hossein sounded very depressed today. He was giving a very sort of negative, very critical and hopeless speech about the fact that we are, we are in the t television era and uh, the thinking, the critical thinking that the web allowed is uh, finished because we are all passively watching and also just performing and not really thinking and exchanging thoughts and having good conversations. So, I would like to ask you, Dave, uh, uh, first of all, what, why do you think the web is not dead? Uh, why do you think the open web is so important? And uh, if you think we can recoup the common part, the, the recuperate the commons part of, uh, of the internet, in, uh, as opposed to, you know, once this so, this so called private social media era is over. Do you think it will be over eventually? And do you think there's hope for a future collaborative commons? Okay. Um, well, the web, first of all, the web isn't a living being. So the word dead, I mean, I'm really into words. And um, so how do you parse the sentence, the web is dead? People say things like that. Um, TechCrunch wrote a story a few years ago, a number of years ago, that said RSS is dead. Um, and I totally objected to that because what does that mean? Is that journalism? I mean, it's not. If I say something that's never been alive, if I say this badge is dead, you would think I'm crazy. This thing's never been alive. It can't be dead. The word doesn't work. So find another way to describe the problem or whatever it is you're talking about because dead isn't the word. Um, so what I think people mean when they say that, I'm not exactly sure what they mean, but I think they mean that it's diminished, that it's not as uh, all-encompassing, as universal as perhaps they once thought it was. And I can certainly, by the way, I, Hossein is a friend of mine and I adore him and I think I agree with everything that he says. I just happen to have different colored glasses I see the same thing he sees. And from his point of view, um, I think a lot of you missed the, the video at the beginning. He spent, what was it, he, is he here? Oh, he's not, seven years, oh, he's back there. I think it was seven years he spent in jail and it was a very important seven years. It was, what, 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 when did it start? 2001, 2002, is he here? You started in 2008. Okay, so the, the blogosphere was blooming in 2008. It was, and then when he comes out, it's not dead, but it's, there's this whole new thing. There's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's all this other stuff. So I could see from his point of view, he needs some words to describe what happened because what we saw happen in a very gradual way, he saw all at once. And it makes it an incredible perspective. Um, and it was, when I read his piece, I thought, well, this is really something. I don't agree with his conclusion, but, uh, but it's worth thinking about. Um, 
it's, it isn't even diminished, okay? That's the other thing. I mean, you have this huge thing, Facebook, and Twitter is also huge, um, and all the other things that we call social media. But I think that if you were to draw a graph that showed the size of the open web and the amount of hours people spend using it, I think it would probably be going up all the time, the whole period. Its percentages probably would be going down. Um, so I don't think Facebook has to go away. I don't think that Facebook even has to diminish for the open web to have a healthy future. Um, there's no reason, you know, blogging in its initial stages totally existed while TV existed. I don't see why the two can't coexist. I think Facebook could do a lot to help there. Um, I'm a, you know, I'm a heavy user of Facebook. I'm on there all, every day, all, all the time, just like everybody else. But I also blog. Um, I would like it if they would let us point to our stories from, you know, get, provide linking. I mean, Facebook, for a lot of people, is what the blogosphere was to us. So why shouldn't they have all the features of the web available to them? And the most important feature is linking. Um, so it, it doesn't, it's not a very kind thing for Facebook to do, to sort of suck up so much of the energy of the web and then not deliver the most important feature. It's sort of like if you ended up monopolizing swimming but you didn't include, I don't know, I, mean, I, I didn't think the whole thing through. <laughs> but if you monopolize some activity and you don't, bring through, you don't bring the water through, right? I mean, it's like the most basic thing. You know, you can sit there, you can look at the lake, but you can't actually go into, maybe you can put your feet in, but you can't really get the, the sense of it. There's just no reason. Now, there was a third part to your question. I'm not remembering what it was. Yes, it was uh, why, what do you think, what is the open web? Oh. And, uh, and how can we recuperate the commons part right, of it? Right, okay, yeah, I, I, I wanted to comment on that. See, I think the blogosphere did a perfectly good job of killing itself, okay, if, if, if you want to continue the whole dead metaphor. Um, I have a, a fairly unique perspective on that um, because I was sort of like the root blog, you know, in the sense that if you have a tree, you know, they actually had a site, I think it was called Blog Tree, where everybody that started a blog would go and just enter a link to the blog that got them started blogging. And it was incredible because I, my blog was at the root of that tree. In other words, the, if you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Sort of like go back all the generations. And I remember the moment when I you know, started looking around. I was always looking around to see if anything was happening. And one day, I just, it was like, it wasn't there the day before. And then, boom, there are all these blogs. And I see a list of all of them somewhere. And I go, this is incredible. Look, it worked. And I click on the links to go to them. And they're all flaming me. <laughs> I'm the reason for every one of their problems. And I go, oh, this. First I go, this isn't good. And I go, well, okay, maybe this is just the way it is. You know, Maybe it has to be this way. Maybe this is just the way human, human beings are. Uh, but what, and what happened, and again, this is from my perspective, is they started treating me like I was a corporation. Like I didn't have a soul, I didn't have a personality, but I was just a person. And that was a major disconnect. They started looking to me kind of the way people look to Facebook. You know, why don't they do this for me? Why don't they do that for me? Well, because I was, and it put a lot of pressure and I tried to do what they were expecting and, and, uh, and eventually it broke me. I mean, it, and I remember there was a time in 2003 when I had to shut down weblogs.com. There were a whole bunch of a series of events that happened. I knew almost nobody was using it. I mean, I had the numbers. And but there was a tremendous amount of spam on it. And... Uh, and the eruption, the hate, the, the, the vileness of it, it was, and they, these people had an incredible power, this power of individual publishing, but they were using it in an incredibly selfish way. They were, and they were projecting all kinds of infantile emotions on it, and it wasn't real. Um, so I think that if the blogosphere had evolved in a more realistic way, 
where it was understood that we were all individuals, every one of us, and that we should have been relying on each other more, and we should all take up some of the slack and do some of the work that was required to keep the whole thing functioning and healthy. And I th then it would have thrived. It would have been great. Uh, but the people, and I'm, it wasn't just me, but the people who were put in a central position, we moved on because there was no reward for us. There was nothing, you know, I come from my, you know, my experience, I was in Silicon Valley in the 80s and, you know, did a bunch of startups. And there, they were rewards in those situations. There were reasons, and I was, had enough revenue to hire people to work, to do support and, and keep the whole system running. But that never happened with blogging. And um, so if you want to have something where individuals are empowered, and this was the hype about blogging, is that it really gave the power to the individuals, then the individuals have the responsibility also to, to be realistic about it. So the day that bloggers, and there are a lot of bloggers out there, this is the thing that people don't get. We're just not tied together anymore. There's no sort of central structure, nor should there really ever be a central structure, but there should be tools to help you discover blogs. There should be some resources put into centralization facilities. If there, I mean, it is a distributed network, but we have learned that you need to have at least some centralization to pull these things off. So what, what went wrong with the blogosphere is that all bloggers are disconnected in individual small areas without connecting to each other anymore. I mean, you expected it to be more of a community. And I don't know what there. I expected. I think that, uh, I, yeah, I hoped perhaps. You hoped. Well, I mean, I so, would, I but would. what's the possible plan to have that really happen now? I mean, you've seen how things have been going. I mean, I have to say, if you go on Scripting News, his blog, which has been there forever, uh, the, the claim says it's the, even worse the, than it appears. Now, that doesn't sound very hopeful. Do you want to sort of elaborate on what's even worse? <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> it, it turns out it's an incredible description. I mean, it also appears every time one of my links shows up on Facebook or Twitter because they pick that metadata up, right? And so whatever the headline says, it could say, you know, Google's really screwing us. And then the tagline says it's even worse than it appears. It, it, a lot of my blog posts are complaints. And period, a lot, of, a lot of Twitter posts, a lot of Facebook posts, a lot of blog posts, a lot of what we write about are the world is really screwed up for the following reasons, and this is why I see how to fix it. That is a template for blog posts. So it's even worse than it appears, actually. It's a line from a Grateful Dead song, uh, the Touch of Grey. It goes, I know the rent is in arrears, the dog has not been fed in years, it's even worse than it appears. I'm thinking of changing it, though. So you're a deadhead. I'm uh, not a deadhead, <laughs> no, but I thought it was a, a great, it's a wonderful song, yes. and it, it really fits. <laughs> So, you wrote that you fear Google control. Why? Oh, God. Well, uh, because... We talked about Facebook, but we didn't talk about Google. Well, uh, because the open web is the thing that makes the web a miracle, uh, and it is a miracle. In, in human evolution, there are not a whole lot of examples of things like the open web. Um, I call it a platform with no platform vendor. You know, if it were owned by a company, it would have, it would have uh, broken 15 times in the last 25 years. It wouldn't, today you can go back to the, you say my blog's been around forever, it's been since 1994. You can go back and read the posts that I wrote in 1994 in a web browser today, and they still work. And the reason they work is there's no, no corporation fucking it up. Nobody gets to say, that we're sweeping up all of the old blogs and now you have to all you know, migrate to this new way of doing the web. And that's the way, you know, the software I used to create my first blog, in 1990, my first post in 1994, I guarantee you that software doesn't run today. It doesn't, I mean, it runs on the Mac OS. They've deprecated the, oper the version of the operating system. Deprecate is a word you should, be, you should watch for that word. When a tech company says they're deprecating something, that means they're exerting their control 
and they're saying that all the old stuff is gone, and now you have to, if you want to go to the next level, you have to do what they tell you to do. And believe me, their motives in doing that are often really, really ugly. And the, the reason why the open web is great is that nobody owns it, and nobody can do that. So you can't say, you know, you have to make this transition or else your site will not work on the open web. Nobody gets to do that. But Google is trying to do that to the open web. They're trying to make it a Google platform. And they're doing it in, in a very dishonest way. Uh, but they said they would do no evil. <laughs> Well, they took that back, actually. <laughs> they decided evil's okay. I mean, when, what happens, what does it mean when you d delete don't be evil on your website? Does that mean that evil is the way? I think it kind of does. Deleting that is an act of evil. Um, uh, so anyway, so Google has a great story that goes with this. We're, we're doing this because it's good for everybody. It makes the web more secure, blah, blah, blah. Well. That's nice, but the web isn't safe. Life isn't safe. Safety is overrated. Um, let the web be. If you want something that is safe, that I call it Disneyland. If you want the web to become Disneyland, create a new thing and call it Disneyland or call it safe, call it whatever you want. But the web isn't changing. That's my position. The web is what it is. If Google wants to shut my site off because I'm not conforming to their deprecation, go for it. I'm, all f I'm okay with that, it doesn't bother me. So, your, um, your negative idea from, of Google started, I think, when Google shut off Google Reader of no, the, the RSS? No, no, not really. Not really? No. Uh -uh. You've always thought this of Google? No. From the very beginning? No, no, if okay. you go back to like 2000, um, I gave them an award for being the ultimate distraction on the web, the best thing on the web. Right. When Google started, I mean, it, I don't know how many people here remember when Google was brand new, right? I mean, it was incredible. I mean, look, all of a sudden you can find stuff. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, right. it was like all of a sudden the lights went on. <laughs> it was great. I mean, the, the, it w and it was perfect because it, it adopted the philosophy of the web in every way. And so yeah, no, they, they were a great company and they, they are still a great company for sure. A lot of the things they do are, are absolutely fine. You even made a bet with yeah. the New York Times saying that Yeah, actually. that blogging blog posts would actually come up in the search of Google more than New York Times articles. So right. you're betting on blogging winning over New Journalistic articles. And using Google as the way of Google. measuring that. Yeah. Yeah. It was for long Can you now. tell us about that bet? Because, I mean, sure. it brings us it to was... journalism, which is a topic that we are going to be talking about consequences of the state of the net also in journalism. Um, well, I made the bet with uh, Martin Niesenholtz, who was the CEO of New York Times Digital and a friend of mine. Um, and uh, with the Long Now Foundation, um, which is, I don't know how, how it's about longevity, long-term thinking. And uh, uh, it was the first long bet that they did. It was for five years. And the bet was, as you said, that- 2002. That blogging would rate, blogging of, take the top news story from whatever year was five years in the future. And, or take the top five stories, I think it was. And blogs will rank higher on searches for that story in that year. And I knew that I was gonna win the bet because I was pretty sure the New York Times would put up a paywall, which would mean their stories wouldn't be in the search engine at all. It was kind of a trick bet, but I won. <laughs> More than 10 years later now, what Google is doing with us journalists is uh, trying to help us rank <laughs> higher and by Did doing, you say they're trying to help you? Is yeah, that what you said? Okay. This, is, <laughs> this is what's happening right now is that we, there's something called the trustproject.org and it's funded also by Google among the major funders. It started in the Silicon Valley at the Mercura Center in Santa Clara University 
And the trust project, actually the idea is if we put a whole bunch of tags and we adhere to, we have indicators that show that what we are writing is trustworthy, mm, okay. so our staff, they will uh, reward us by make, ranking us higher in the searches. That you sounds think, like a good idea, no? I mean, yeah, I don't know. This is something that's happening and uh, in Italy only La Stampa and La Repubblica are starting to try to do that. Well, how do you that. feel about that? Does that help you? I'm actually the one who's doing that at La Stampa, so I'm, I believe in that a lot, even if I think it's going to take a lot of time. Gigi, before, was talking about the fact that we need time to educate, time, time to learn, and uh, I think it takes educating the, new, yeah, the journalists uh, to understand how important it is to apply those indicators, indicators of diversity, of transparency, yeah. of correction, being public editor, I have to do that, and, and uh, there's a problem with the fact that we're always running fast, trying to run stories, even if they're not proofread and uh, they're not fact-checked, and then we correct them later, and we betray the trust of our readers by doing that, well, and if and we don't do it in a transparent every, way. Yeah. So I, I, I'm actually grateful to Google that Google is helping us doing that, but then I think we should be able to do it alone without the help of platforms. Right. That would be the ideal. Right. I think the, the more independent the news industry is of the tech industry, the better things are. Yeah, and you said my, something about the fact that tech, we should own the technology to be able to Yeah, I mean, be I, I don't think, right, one of the things you hear from journalists a lot is they want help from Facebook, they want help from Google, um, and I think that's, I think that it's not a good idea. I think that journalism should start its own Facebook. I, want, I wanted uh, journalism to do that uh, long before Facebook even existed. That, uh, but it, it goes against the grain. That idea goes against the grain of the way journalists think. Because suppose, well I know because I proposed this to my friend Martin at the New York Times in uh, 2002 that they uh, offer blog, free blog hosting to anybody who was quoted in a New York Times story. That would be the metric. So if you're, you know, a, a source and you're uh, authoritative enough or newsworthy enough to be quoted in a Times story, then you get a blog, okay? okay. And, um, and the idea was to get lots of blogs from interesting newsworthy people. And um, I also at the same time asked them for a license to their XML feeds. And I got that, but they wouldn't do the, uh, the, the blogs. And, and my theory is, had they done that, there would be no Facebook today. Because, um, or Facebook would be, certainly wouldn't be in the news business. Because any reputable news organization that had taken that approach as early as 2002 or 2003 would have become the go-to place for news. And, uh, but it goes against the grain, as I understand it, of how reporters look at the world, journalists look at the world, which is we don't want the riffraff and the rabble in there amongst us. We it's, need also, to... it's also a problem of moderating the comments and not having the resources to do that. This isn't about comments. The people wouldn't get any flow unless they, unless they got people to read their stuff. This isn't com people put comments on blogs for a different reason. They want to get into your flow. In other words, if people are coming to read this article, they put it there because they know a certain number of people are going to see it. Right? That's, why they put, that's why comments are a problem. But if somebody puts something radically stupid in their own blog, who's going to see it? Nobody. I mean, we could have had this discussion, but we didn't even have it at the time. Because the thought was, and it is still pervasive in the journalism world today, is that you need to have risen up this ladder in order to have news. And it's on its face is not true. Um, it's not. And uh, I had this idea that I promoted all through that period. It was just sources go direct. That was the idea. And that was going to be the impact of the technology that we were developing. And it came true. Unfortunately, uh, we got Trump as our sources go direct guy. <laughs> Okay, so we go and talk about politics. <laughs> we could talk about it. Well, well it, it, it's all related, Anna. I mean, it's, it's not related, government, tech, journalism, the people. 
All these things, those four things, are inseparable. That's why when Hossein put up earlier, what did he say? He said, democracy equals journalism. My thought was, what a joke. Because the way we practice journalism today is totally anti-democratic. There's not an ounce of democracy in that. It's all elitism. It's all just breathing fumes. It's lunacy to think that that's democracy. But the truth of it is, is that if journalism were practiced properly, and that means the egos of the reporters drop down, you know, I mean, I have had this experience. I wrote for it's Wired. It's too elitist, right? It, you're, you're saying that journalism it is just as elitist as politics. And oh my so God. It's, elite. It's, it's all part of the same system. It's an elitist system. That's why, that's where the, you know, we're, the other guy, um, I don't remember his name, the, the Dutch guy, is that you? Right. Was saying, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, but um, uh, you came very close to saying what I think is the absolute baseline of why, of what people want, is we want meaning in our lives. And as perverse as it sounds, Trump gives that to people. And it's, it's ridiculous that that's the best we can do to give meaning to people's lives, you know? I mean, yeah, well, it happens here in Italy too. We have right. Salvini. And journalism, the fact, I'm sorry for interrupting, but uh, the, the fact that journalism is so exclusive is the biggest part of the problem. And David, Dave, you were saying this too about um, stories and about you know, giving the power of storytelling to everybody that means listening, it means people need to listen to each other. And you need, you know, uh, um, it, it's the- But the how do you give meaning? I mean, the word meaning is crucial, but how do you give meaning? What's the possible plan to be able well, to I do that? Well, I think meaning, okay, meaning means it's funny to say that, right? Meaning means, but they, I guess it is related. Meaning means I'm doing something to make the world better. It's, it sounds drippy and altruistic and, and, and uh, idealistic and all the rest, but the truth is that in our hearts, we all want to make the world better. It is what we want. It's what it, I'm getting an emotional reaction right now just saying these words. It's like it, makes, it reaches inside my heart that I want to do something, and we, we all, unless we're somehow sociopaths, we all want to do this. We all want meaning in our lives. You know, there was this moment in the Obama campaign, we all thought that, by the way, I just want to thank all the Italians here for letting me speak English. I think it's an, a miracle that I get to do that here. Um, and we are a very powerful, influential country, but inside we don't get that in America. We don't understand that the people don't get that. But, that was a moment when we felt, at least some of us felt, that we were able to do something extremely meaningful in electing Obama because we thought, or I did, and a lot of us did, that at that moment, our system of government would change and that we would be able to, using the tools of the internet, because Obama, if you, I don't know if you all recall, but he used the internet in a, an incredible way to do his community organizing. So the thought was that he would take office and leave his organizing system in place and we would be able to govern because the whole concept of the United States is about self-government. So why shouldn't we be part of the government? Why should we only be part of electing people? Well, he didn't do it. He took office and that site went down and it was replaced with a, you can petition the government site. How arrogant is that? I mean. Why do I want to petition the government? It's my government, <laughs> right? I mean, it's like, Is this what you meant when you said disruption comes from people, not from Silicon that's, Valley? That's right, that's right. And I lived, I had the, the miracle of living through that not once but twice in my life. The first time was with the personal computer revolution. I mean, and when I came on in the tech industry was uh, the late 70s. And the conventional wisdom was at that time that it was all sewn up, that IBM and had it, and the mini computer companies, they had it all sewn up. And if you wanted to work in the computer industry, you had to go work for one of those companies. And I, made, I decided to go make software for the uh, Apple II. And uh, I remember going to the uh, computer conference, at, uh, National Computer Conference, which they don't have anymore. And they had the personal computer pavilion 
It was like this beautiful, cute little place off on the side. And they all came and visited. They said, oh, isn't it nice what you boys and girls are doing? And we go, yeah, well, we'll come back in a few years. <laughs> and the whole, and that was the story, the, the thought that people would have computers. It's a foreign idea. People didn't get that. And then the web, like 15 years later, less than 15 years later, did the exact same thing to the PC industry. They thought they had it all wrapped up and they were busy having all their wars over email protocols and their networking standards. You had a whole bookshelf of specs that you had to master. The barriers to entry were just incredibly huge. No individual could do it. So Tim Berners-Lee comes along and creates the web, which they couldn't believe it. The docs for programming the web, it's not a bookshelf, it's about that thin. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I always thought you could do it, <laughs> but the tech industry wasn't giving it to us. And, and so then they poo-pooed it, you know? They said, Bill Gates said, oh, well, nobody will ever use that, it's too complicated. And then two years later, he's retooling his company because he's a smart guy, and he, kn he knew when he lost. And, uh, and so they come back and try it again, and they're, we're right back at that spot again where Google t tries to take over the open web like they're doing right now very quietly and they're putting all this sugar on it saying how, oh, we're just doing it for you because we love you so much. And uh, what they're doing is they're planting the seeds of their own destruction. It has to happen. We already know we can do it. We simply. need to do disruption in Europe too, though. All the Silicon Valley companies are in Europe and we feel like we are being taken over by America. Yeah. I, know. There's not, I, mean, I mean, we saw the companies that were here today showcasing too, they're not, they're not European. They're, they're American country, companies. They're they? American companies. Yeah. Is somebody doing something right that you think in terms of uh, journalism we were talking about? You, you mentioned in politics Obama for peace and in technology. I mean, can you show us what you think, where do you think someone is doing something right? Are there some examples? <sighs> You know, I'm really bad at these questions. I guess I, I must have a negative point, point of view. I mean, there, <laughs> you see because, only the bad because stuff. it's hard really to, to do that. I mean, in journalism, I really like Axios, okay? But I wouldn't give them an overall thumbs up. What I would say is what they're doing is they're accepting uh, how people like to read on the web and how they want their news. I mean, I read so many articles. They don't have a paywall. That's the first thing. I mean, think paywalls are death for news. Um, and I know that a lot of people in news agree with that, yet they do it anyway. Seems to be sort of like, okay, well, we'll kill ourselves. What the hell, let's see what happens. Um, and the thing that I like about Axios is that, well, what I don't like about other places is they make you read, you know, 20 screenfuls before you get to, and they never really get to the point of delivering. And they said, well, let's just give it to them up front. Let's, let's tell them, why they came, what they came here to find out and put it in the first paragraph. And then they have a common structure, you know, for each story and the bullet points are all really clear and it's, it's easy to read. And I know that's like a really lame thing to, but that's how dismal the situation is, is that, you know, there is nobody that's doing it totally right. The way to do it to totally right would be to let the sources create the news and use the journalists to present the news. So a citizen journalism that has uh, journalists kind of coordinated? Yeah, I've, you know, I've resisted the term citizen journalism, but I think I'm willing to go with it now because hmm. I think that we're in such dire straits right now with journalism that we need to do something really radical. One thing I think we need to do is teach every student high school student should take a class in journalism. We have to, I mean, if we had done that 30 years ago, think about how different the situation would be now. Train, train to critical thinking. That's right. Kids. And actually be able to write a story with the rigor of a journalist, you know? And, you know, doing the actual research and the interviews and, um, looking, you know, studying what other people have written about, you know, the, the intellectual process of, it's like what you were saying before about how you have to be careful about the truth of the stories that you write. The readers have to be careful about that too. And uh, people talk about, you know, 
news literacy. And I don't think they mean news literacy in the sense that uh, you're so literate at news that you could actually write it, because that's very dangerous, right? It was the same thing that the tech industry resisted. This idea that anybody could make software was a really radical idea, but that was the miracle of the personal computer. I mean, I made software myself, and I was a, you know, I had a master's in computer science, so I had all the training, but I made software on an Apple II, the exact same computer that my users were using. So it was, it, and that was a, a, an outrageous thing to do, but the, the computer industry survived it. I believe the journalism industry would survive it too. It's a change that journalism hasn't been willing to adopt yet. Craig Newmark uh, just donated $2 million to CUNY. $20 million. $20 million yeah. to CUNY, yeah, the City University of New York. It's a public school. If you had $20 million... You know the answer to this What would question, you do? Because I wrote it, right? I would, I would create a foundation that, that taught... Well, first thing I would do... Uh, this, I don't know if many people... You know who Cy Hirsch is? Cy, Cy Hirsch is a legendary reporter who worked for the New York Times, uh, uh, for the New Yorker. I think he still writes for the New Yorker. He's 81 years old. He just wrote a memoir. He's been doing all these interviews all over, you know, radio in uh, the U.S. And I would have... And he's incredible. If you get a chance to listen to one of these, I mean, he's a phenomenal storyteller. He is irreverent. Uh, his ego is as huge as this room, which is fine because it's justified. He broke some of the most amazing huge stories and irreverence isn't really a good word for it. I mean, a lot of journalism, and he talks about this, is afraid of offending power. And, you know, there, there's this great line about how journalism is supposed to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, or maybe it's the other way around, right? Yeah, or, there's many ways of saying it, but, but yeah. But very few actually do it. Well, Cy Hirsch is one of them. I would pay Cy Hirsch a million dollars. Well, he doesn't need, I'd give him $10,000 and fly him all over the world and have him talk to high school to students. To evangelize. Yeah, and just tell his story. So, yeah. And let the kids ask him questions. Give them a role model, something to aim at. And then with the rest of it, somehow get teach kids to be journalists. I mean, I, I appreciate that Craig did that. I think it's a good thing. I mean, Craig made a lot of money off of Craig's list, um, and he can do it, and it's good that he is doing it. Uh, but, but I think that he's investing in the kind of journalism that has gotten us into a lot of trouble, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. And I, I think it's okay, but I really would like to see... I, I wrote this publicly, and he retweeted it, so... Um, maybe he'll just You're be inspired. He, he maybe he'll do it. <laughs> well, software developers. I don't have the money. I can't do that. Let's talk about yeah. you as a software developer, knowing all the other software developers that are good out there. I mean, are you guys going to make a plan? Are you planning something to save the web into the open web and, 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 and to do something that's after Facebook that's viable for us and for the future? I'm afraid to say no. No. No, nobody is doing that. Nobody's doing it. Nobody's getting together because uh, Tim Berners Lee said, uh, you know, Tim Berners Lee said he wanted to do that. And, and uh, yeah, but he, when we he made a that, call for yeah, that. Tim, Tim Berners Lee made his contribution, and it's invaluable, obviously. It's incredibly important. But I think when Tim Berners Lee says that, what he really means is that we should do it the way he says we should do it. And if you actually look at the way he says we should do it, you'd go, well, Nobody understands what you're talking about, Tim, so I don't see how we can do it. <laughs> you know, it's sad that, that, that no technologists are not, I don't know what it is, but no, it's not happening, unfortunately. I, if somebody were doing it and, uh, and there was some way I could help, I would. And I think that we need more of that kind of attitude, not that this is the way to do it, will you help me? Because I've, I have tried that many, many times. What do you think will happen after, with Facebook and Google? Do you see, we only have 18 seconds left and I wanted to ask if That's anybody has any no, questions. No, no, I, I think we can go for like about two more hours. Oh, they gave us 
No, it's actually time is it's over. It's going forward. It's going forward because our time is over. The, fr the green is off and just now it's red. Just ignore it. Make them take us off the stage. No, we, are, <laughs> we, we want people to raise their hands if they ask questions. Wait, wait, wait. wait. You were getting us something interesting. Facebook yeah. and Google. Yeah. What, what will happen with them? Well, I think what Facebook is, is dying right now, to use one of Hossein's favorite words. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a ghost town. It's very quiet. They could call it quiet book. Um, you know, I'm seeing incredible bugs in their algorithm. I'm seeing stories, the same, when I go back there, I see the same story at the top over and over and over again. And it was a story I didn't like the first time I saw it, but I'm seeing it so many times. Um, so no, I don't think there's much future for Facebook unless they figure out, I think Facebook as a company right now is very scared and uh, they're a little bit, I think, and they're justified to be scared. They, they found out that they're incredibly powerful, and I don't think, honestly, they thought that their technology was being used for anything but good, and they learned something very negative about themselves, and they're not responding well to it. Do you um, think antitrust will uh, break them up? Do you think it would be fair to, if they did that? I don't think that it will happen. I mean, uh, Look at the Justice Department in the United States. Maybe it'll happen in Europe, yeah. but it won't. It, I don't expect that that would happen. Nor do I think that it it would be a remedy. I think people don't understand what happened at Facebook. I think journalism has really flubbed this one. I mean, they, I'm a Facebook developer. I have built a few products that use Facebook, and I understand what their API is capable of. I understand what capabilities Cambridge Analytica used. And I'm appalled at the way the press has reported it. You know, the press either doesn't understand or doesn't care. And they're, you know, number one. Number two, this story was available in 2010 and the press didn't report it. They were just perfectly happy to tell the story of Zuckerberg's dorm room. And, you know, isn't it great? Look at how cute he is. He's gonna reinvent the world. I mean, they were just a PR arm for Zuckerberg, and all of a sudden, oh, he's the worst thing in the world. It, it was, I think, I think that, who was it? Somebody said here today that the Democratic Party blames everybody but themselves. I think that it could be said equally about journalism. It, it, okay, enough about. <laughs> I know you're a journalist, railing but, against but here's my think, category. I, I think the of world of Anna, okay, but, but this I, is it I, right I, here. <laughs> right here, this is it, okay? She should be neutral about this. She I should am, let me. I am neutral, okay. but we, ha we are running out of time. Oh, we're not. We're That's over so, time. Are we out of time? Power? But no, we got the idea, and I, I, oh, part, says, I partly agree. You, we got the idea. The, 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 we we, we, we to need go? to improve. We need to improve as journalists. We need probably also tech developers to help us and uh, be more. And maybe we should ally to make better products. Don't you think? Let us help you. I help mean, us. And, uh, you know, you guys Please. always go. We're very to the, happy if you help us. Well, this is like an abusive relationship, okay? <laughs> that journalists always go to the abusers for help. They go to Facebook, they go to Google, and these guys are the problem. But, but can you blame us for going much, there? They have too much power and they have too much money. Instead, journalism should go to poor developers who don't have a lot of money, but who love journalism yeah. and think that they might be able to make a career out of making software that is just perfect for you, and when you come back with a feature request, they will compete to give you what you want, instead of just saying, oh no, you know, here, take this, and you know, whatever. One last thing, since the love. sponsor, love the sponsor. Love is the answer, love. Love is the answer. Love is the, the answer. The sponsor of this state of the net is, one of the sponsors is also Amazon. Amazon is doing developing for the Washington Post. Have you seen their work in the, is the Washington Post better than other newspapers, other news I, organizations? I'd love to see their content management system. I've never seen it. I would be, I would be thrilled to yeah. see what they're doing there. We are all very jealous that they have uh, developers that are so rich and empowered. I think and that able maybe to Amazon product. knows how to how to listen to developers and 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 knows how to talk with. I mean, you know, I use a lot of Amazon services. And it's a good company. I mean, it's. Uh, I don't think they've. I wouldn't call them a model for how journalism should work in the 21st century. But they invested in journalism. But it's, it's observable how much more functional the Washington Post is after Bezos than prior to Bezos. So mm -hmm. it, I'd say, yeah, it's a pretty good thing. Yeah. 
Okay, so we well, let us help you. Love is the this answer. Is we need developers helping journalists. Totally. <laughs> we didn't really cover part the consequences of all this uh, technology on politics, but we are seeing it happening right now. Well, we did. We did cover it. We did. We, we said it's all the same we thing. We are too elitist. And it's we all the same thing, Anna. So if if you if something good happens in tech, that will mean something good happens in politics. If something good happens in politics, that means something good happens for the people. If something good happens with the people, that means something great happened in journalism. It's all the same thing. When it all works, it will all be part of a system. Okay, thank you very much, Dave Weiner. Thank you. Thank you.